Britain is in the grip of a knife crime epidemic. That's according to new figures released by the government. There were almost 20,000 offences involving a knife last year and conviction rates are falling. Joining me in the studio now, Talk TV correspondent Oliver Whitfield Mirchich and former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley. Good to have you both here. Let's get the uh, overview from Oliver and then we'll talk to Peter about what can be done and also what's causing this. Um, Oliver, what, what, are the, what is the situation? So the data shows that this number is pretty much steady from where it was last year. This is the number of people who are going before a court and are then sentenced in some way by a judge. Now, it's important to note that this is an underrepresentation of the true scale of knife crime because not everybody is put before a judge. Sometimes there's not enough evidence to prosecute, sometimes the police don't see, sometimes victims are too ashamed to come forward. I was speaking to one of the cameramen outside court today. He said he was in the park this weekend, somebody pulled a knife on his 12-year-old son to steal that mobile phone. That wasn't reported to the police. But what in, in essence shows is that London is still the knife crime capital, three times more than the next closest place, which is great, and Manchester, then you go down to the West Midlands. But it's not just the big city areas where knife crime is happening now. Cambridgeshire, uh, West Yorkshire, up in Cleveland in the north, these places which are more rural and previously wouldn't have had that big a knife crime problem are now registering their highest knife crime statistics since 2012. All at the same time, the number of suspended sentences that are being issued are going up, while the number of straight to jail sentences are coming down. Now, the Ministry of Justice, in response, had this to say to us. They said, more criminals carrying a knife are being sent to jail for longer than they were a decade ago, thanks to the decisive action of this government to protect the public and make our streets safer. Our recent changes to sentencing mean repeat knife offenders are now more likely to face jail, and they're now more police officers than ever to bring in, but, but, sorry, more officers than ever before in England and Wales who will help bring in more criminals to justice. However... That's the opposite of what I just said at the beginning of the programme, yeah, isn't it? It sort of it goes a little bit against what we've heard in the data today, but also what we've heard from repeated Home Secretaries, that governments were going to be tough on knife crime, tough on the sources of knife crime, police would be given more uh, stop and search powers, and also these new laws to stop the so-called zombie knives, these huge machetes which are often used to devastating effect. You've only got to speak to the victims of knife crime, to families that have lost somebody to knife crime, to know how insidious a problem this is. It's deep set in our big urban centres, but now going out towards more rural areas. All right, let's bring in Peter Blexley here. I mean, you're not surprised by this. I know you and I have discussed this many, many times, far too many times on far too many different programmes. And one of the obviously overwhelming factors here is that knives are a part and parcel of all our lives. We use them to cut bread with, we use them to cut meat with, we use them for work, we use them all the time. They're easy to get hold of, they're absolutely everywhere. And so to eliminate them from life is impossible. And that's presumably one of the bedrock problems here. Yeah, and the trouble is, too many people use them to cut other human beings yeah. with. Um, we've only seen a couple of teenagers this afternoon convicted of murder of yet another teenager. Today is a very apposite and sad day for me and many others. It is the 17th anniversary since a 16-year-old boy and very promising footballer with my club, QPR, Kyan Prince, yes. was murdered by a knife. His father... Dr Mark Prince has been utterly heroic in trying to convince youngsters to not take a weapon out onto the streets. And so have many others involved in charities. This problem is not going away. And in my opinion, just ignore the stats for the time being. They've been skewed by barrister strikes, COVID, courts not being open. The big headline is knife crime is a massive problem. OK, we know this, don't we? We're all aware of it. And when you say uh, Kyan Prince's father, we remember the Mizzen family who've campaigned, you know, so energetically all these years after they lost their son Jimmy Mizzen and Brooke Kinsella and so many other names. I mean, there are just too many to mention whose lives have been devoted to trying to make some kind of reparations to the rest of society for the devastation that has ruined and nuked their own family. And every time it boils down to a knife. So, so first question, 
why is knife crime on the increase, in particular, as Oliver just said, in rural areas where we wouldn't have expected it? I will answer your question, but in all due honour to my great friend Trent Tracy Hansen, mm -hmm. who I spent time with only on Tuesday, her son Josh Hansen murdered with a knife of course. in 2015. There are too many, and that's so why I can't on. list them all. There are so many. And so it goes yeah. on. In my opinion, the police surrendered the streets many years ago with the abandonment of patrolling those streets. OK, I get it, they will say, we're too busy going from 999 call to 999 call to be patrolling the streets like the old Bobby did. Well, many people have fond memories of those old Bobbies and senior police officers in certain forces are saying we're going to bring back neighbourhood policing. Will we ever see that Bobby on the beat like we used to? I don't know, but we should because they as friendly and in their outgoing manner that they might have been, actually made the streets a hostile environment for criminals. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do to the streets so of Britain. Just explain. Let's say we've got a rural area and let's say they did, that, that police service did provide bobbies on the beat in the sorts of numbers that we used to have them. I don't know when we're thinking about whether we're thinking of the 70s or we're thinking of the 50s or we're thinking of time before that, but, you know, the optimum time when Dixon of Doc Green was saying evening all and there were actual bobbies on the beat, people did know them, local school children knew them, they did have intelligence because people did tell them things, they did have their ear to the ground. This isn't cloud cuckoo land or looking through rose-tinted glasses, this is true, this is what it really was like and many of us remember it like that. Um, if we could do that, let's say in just one rural area, what difference would it make, do you think, to the crime, knife crime prevalent at the moment in that area? The key word amongst what you just said is intelligence. Mm -hmm. A good neighbourhood cop comes back at the end of their shift. They might not have arrested anybody, OK, so there's no measurable kind of target that can be, be put upon right. them. But what they will do if they're doing their job properly is they will be awash with tea mm -hmm. and they'll be awash with information. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. And then the smart home beats, as we used to call them in London, they then feed that information into the proactive groups. So that if, for example, little Johnny at 123 Acacia Avenue is reported to be carrying a knife, then the proactive cops in plain clothes would plug themselves hidden outside little Johnny's address, and when he walked out onto the street the following day, he'd be stopped, he'd be searched, and if he had a knife, he'd be arrested. Uh -huh. That's kind of how it works, in a simplistic kind of way. But, of course, not only is it important for knife crime, it's important to build those community links with people from whatever faith, sexual persuasion, minority they may come from. It's been lost. It needs to be regained. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's going to be the panacea and the cure-all. It won't be, but it would be a very good start. All right, let's go to my guest, Donna Murray-Turner. Donna's the chair of the Safer Neighbourhood in Croydon. Croydon's a London borough that's seen a dramatic reduction in deadly violence. Uh, and Donna's going to explain what happened there. Hello, thanks so much for joining us. I mean, a real result in Croydon and a, an area that was ridden and riddled with knife crime before all of this. So, so can you explain, Donna, what happened in Croydon and also whether it can be rolled out across the rest of the country? So first of all, good afternoon. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Yeah, good afternoon, um, Vanessa. I think what happened in Croydon was a combination of a lot of things, but I think the first thing is we have brought certain communities closer, their proximity to power, their access to it is a lot closer than it was before. And so what that has allowed is for some real conversations between um, normally communities that might have been, might be, might been considered that wouldn't engage with certain institutions, um, it's brought that closer and it's allowed the conversation to be real on both sides. Now, that didn't happen overnight. That took a long time to come together. But it's what's worked for us in Croydon, having that real truth to power and equally for power to hear the real truth um, and how it's perceived, how they are perceived by the community, how the community wish to be policed. And not all of that has been comfortable. But it's been necessary. Just so to explain, that there is a Donna, conduit. sorry to interrupt, but when you say not all of that has been comfortable, you might assume that everybody watching and listening might have some idea what you oh. mean. Can you explain a little bit about what would have been the more difficult, delicate, you know, precarious bits of the negotiation and the puzzle here? So historically, uh, the Black Caribbean, Black African community has not had the best relationship with the Metropolitan Police Service. 
and that's not a one-off. That's that's been the, the case since we've been here for the last seventy-five years since the arrival of of the Windrush era. So you know those things, those 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 in, those um, transgenerational or intergenerational traumas that exist uh, within certain communities because of their experience of institutions. That was a massive hurdle to get over, and to find officers that were willing to listen to what that trauma felt like, what that trauma looked like. That was the amazing part, that we actually found senior managers that were Croydon MPS that were willing to not hear, but to listen to the you know other people's experiences so that they could gain the foothold so that we could have the experience that we've had thus far, which is about communication. Um, and, you know, race around women, uh, you know, when Sarah Everard died, I remember going to a community meeting that Friday, and there were officers in tears, in tears, you know, and the, some community members stood by them. It's an understanding now that doesn't always, it's not all roses and handshakes, but at least we have a means and a conduit with which we can have conversations that mean that we are all working together to keep Croydon that much safer, because this is about young people and everybody feeling safe. And Donna, it's working. It is working. It is working and it's... I'm not saying, and I don't. I want everybody to hear this. I, I, I listen to your other guests. Mm. I'm not saying that this is the panacea for everybody, but if every borough command area could find its donors and its Anthony Kings and its, its you know, and its leaders of the Gurdwaras and other places, other religious places, its temples, find those people and set up an intercommunity conversation, and just lay everything on the table. Talk about your past hurts. Talk about the perceptions. But we all know that those conversations, as painful as they were in the beginning, mm -hmm. were working towards something bigger, that the community feels that it has, it has access to the police, it feels that it can correct things that have gone wrong. There have been some terrible things, Vanessa, trust me, but that's another whole different Vanessa uh, Felt show. But we have the access and we have the conversations. And I think on the side of the police, they have credible community um, contacts that, should things go wrong, can often sometimes be you know, used almost as translators for certain situations to soften certain things. So I think it's worked out for everybody on both sides. Donna, if you were the kind of ambassador, and it's a shame you're not really in a highly paid role, because it's absolutely essential, of rolling this out across the country, what you've done in Croydon. And as you've quite rightly said, it's not easy, it's difficult, there are pitfalls, there's anger, there's hurt, there's a misunderstanding, there's potential for it all to go terribly wrong at absolutely any moment. Plus, we do know that there are, and I think Peter will confirm this, I'll just bring him back into the conversation, almost fashions in, 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 in the carrying of knives. That's why it kind of flares up in various neighbourhoods all of a sudden. We've even heard of it flaring up as kind of one-offs in, in, in very expensive public schools. Suddenly, one school has a knife problem. And it's very, very hard, isn't it, to disabuse young people of the idea that if someone else is carrying one, they've got to carry one for their own protection. doesn't matter how many p photographs of bodies at the morgue. I remember doing an item on that on my show about 20 years ago, that kids were being showed dead bodies, deeply wounded bodies um, to try to explain what would happen if you or could happen if you carried a knife. It seems to be counterintuitive. They seem to think if other people are carrying one, they've got to carry one and that kind of a thing. Um, so, so, so do you think that it would be possible to, to change that mindset that if other people have got one, you've got to have one? Yes, I hope so, because all the stats will show if you take a knife out onto the streets, you are far more likely to become a victim of knife crime yourself yeah. than if you didn't have one. I think the heroic Donna yeah. and I are really saying the same thing in many regards. Yeah. It's about those links to the community with the police, mm -hmm. having somebody who knows that community, who, who, who is, whose name is known. Donna was quoting names here. It's a very, very similar kind of model that we're talking about, yeah. and I'm delighted to see the, the, the progress. Absolutely. Made yes, quite. So, Donna, if you were to take this, you know, to Norwich and to Swindon and up to Scotland and everywhere else, would you have almost a blueprint, a kind of rubric of what they should do and how they could do it that is not particularly pertaining to Croydon but could happen? in all the other cities and also the, the, the rural areas of this country? Uh, definitely. This, is, this template can be taken anywhere. It, you know, obviously different demographics, different um, social conditions exist all over this country, but this template could be taken anywhere. This really is about who are your trusted, credible community leaders, community influencers, you know, how, how much do institutions know about how other communities live? Do they go? To their places of worship? Do they know? Go to their shops? 
This is really about understanding communities in a different way that we've done in the past. You know, we tend to look at communities when something goes wrong. Actually, what's happened here in Croydon is that although a lot of things went wrong, we still use the time in between when things were all right to just learn about one another. So the template is there and it can be used 100%. This is not hard. This is not dependent on, you know, one thing or another. It's just the will to want to make the difference. And that basically means the will to want your own kids to stay alive. I mean, it's short, surely a, not a hard sell, this one. It must be an easy sell, but very, very hard to bring about. Donna, listen, I'm going to take up your idea for what you described as a future Vanessa Felt show about the past hurt and about the history and everything else. Strikes me as a show that needs to be made, and I really do hope that you'll join me in making it. And I hope Ollie and Peter will join me too for that particular show.